Green Slashaholics, welcome to episode 17 of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am here with the 80 Slasher Librarian, Josh Swaru. How you doing tonight? Doing good. How's it going, Sean? Good. All right, so now we're doing Final Destination Looks Could Kill, which personally is my favorite of all the ones you've read so far. I mean, I know that's an unpopular opinion, but I just see... Spoiler warning for this entire video. There is no for way we can do podcast. this video, Everything. this podcast, without spoilers. Um, just, you've been warned. So, I like this book because death is personified as a person, and that person is calling, he's meeting up with the main character saying, you spoiled my plans, I don't blame you. He goes into why people are having these premonitions, and he says, you need to fix this, and I'll throw a little incentive in there, and that's something we're going to get into when we go into the bulk of this story. It's like she gets a little, a little payment for every death, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, so are you saying this is your favorite Final Destination book or your favorite book out of all 50? Oh, no, just the Final Destination book. Okay. Oh, okay. no. That's then, then I would say this is maybe top 15 of all the books you've done. So it still okay. ranks pretty high. The, out of the Final Destination ones I've done so far, I think mine are Death of the Senses, Looks Could Kill, Dead Reckoning, and then uh, Dead Man's Hand and Last. Um, that's not going to be a very fun podcast episode. But then again, maybe there's some people that really enjoyed that book. Um, the ending was just weak on that one. But I am enjoying Krista Faust's uh, uh, Final Destination 3 novelization so far. I just I've seen that movie, so I have no basis of comparison. Well, I just narrated the uh, roller coaster premonition, and her attention to detail puts you on the roller coaster as this stuff is going down. It was I just I, I I did it all in like most of that roller coaster scene, which was like ten pages in like one take. It was just it was awesome. Um, but anyways, that's another podcast for another day. Uh, Next week, we got a really exciting episode. Tom McLaughlin's going to be here, the writer-director of Friday the 13th Part 6. And, uh, you know, he's writing a Friday script right now in hopes of getting it made one day. So, Man, I hope. Uh, There's a lot of really cool scripts floating around. I mean, there was one. It was supposed to be the, the 13th, Friday the 13th film, and it was going to... There, I think there was going to be three hockey mask killers in it. It was going to go behind the scenes of... The whole franchise. Uh, th uh, that's something that's more of a discussion for after the slash. Um, well, I, I don't want to make a note of that. I did want to let uh, anybody listening to this now, the day like it comes out, know uh, the reason there has been a little bit of a delay on me getting another Friday the 13th Part 2 novelization upload out is we're having a special celebrity voice guest uh, mm -hmm. voice Paul for the book. And he's recording the lines. It's going to take him another day or two. Uh, I'll tell you this. He was, he's, he's been in a really, really popular recent Friday the 13th project. Uh, and he's been on one of our shows before. Um, so, yeah. Which we've had a couple people connected to Friday the 13th on the show. So that doesn't give it away. It narrows it down, but doesn't give it away. Um, so, yeah. Final Destination looks could kill. Okay. A bunch well, let's, of... look at the of, let's look at the cast of characters we got for this. I'm, I'm going to read this because I cannot remember this. We okay. got Cherie, Cabernet, um, Rosé, Chardonnay, Chablis, Shiraz, Shramalama, Ding Dong. Damn, I can't remember this stuff. They're all Vodka, named drinks. <laughs> Fancy drinks at that. I don't drink this stuff. Anywho, um, they all, they all have... One thing, too. Don't forget them. Who? Thing one and thing two. Yeah. Wrong book. I'm thinking of a different book. Um, it's anyways. Just, they're all named after drinks because they're all models. They're all these fabulous personalities, and they make these names to really create a new name for themselves. They're, they all come from different backgrounds, and Merlot is the modeling agent that goes and finds all these people all over America. So they're all connected through this one woman, and they want to go on a big cruise, and that is what's going to set up the major catastrophe for this, this book. It's going to be the cruise ship disaster. Which now, is the fresh and original. What's that? I was saying, which is a fresh and original take on the premonition thing, the disaster, uh, and it plays out pretty cool. 
Um, yeah. And it gives us a little glimpse at each of our characters as they're showing up for it, at their char- you know, their character traits and everything. It's like, um, here's this person. Wow, she's shallow. Hey, here's this person. Hey, he's shallow. Hey, it's a bunch of shallow people. How are they going to sink this ship in this shallow water? Here's this person. Uh, they're they're a, they're a druggie, you know. Here's this person. Uh, they're in a rocky relationship. Here's this guy. He's an asshole to his girlfriend. Uh, so yeah. Cabernet's pregnant. And she's like one of the only redeemable characters in this book. She's normal and nice. Everyone else is just out to get the other ones and push them down. Gunter uh, wasn't too bad. Gunter wasn't too he, bad. He grew on me. He was kind of kind of abrasive at first, but he really cared, you know. Yeah, he uh, was. All he these was shallow like, people abandon their friends when things get tough, but he yeah. he, he stuck with Cabernet through her pregnancy. So, um, de- decent guy. He so, was supposed to be fully all out hardcore German, and I attempted it. Which, uh, if I get the guts, I might share that clip one day. Uh, <laughs> but it was. I was like, you know what? He's gonna be an American German. <laughs> He's gonna be an American with German heritage. That's what he's going to be. <laughs> it kind of reminded me of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean when they got Bill Nye to be um, Davy Jones. They wanted it. I can't remember what accent they wanted him to do, but he was like, can't do that. I'll do a good Scottish one, though. And they're like, sure, just roll with it. I don't care. So he made Davy Jones Scottish. Oh, man. Uh, so, you know, yours your worked. Uh, but all right. So the main character of this book is uh, Stephanie Sherry Pulaski, and she is the one who has the premonition about the ship going down. And she's the one that's trying to warn everyone, so that's where things get interesting. It was pretty brutal, too, the, the way people died on this boat. And yeah. then, uh, and her death, man, there at the end of it, because uh, usually when these premonitions happen, uh, the person who's seeing it, their death is like quick, you know? Right. And uh, hers wasn't so fast, you know, compared to other ones. So when she snaps out of it and uh, realizes, you know, that it didn't really happen, uh, and she starts trying to convince everybody, of course you got your characters that don't listen. Um, that's just, you're going to have that in Final Destination. Uh, yeah. But what did you think of the way it played out when she woke up from the premonition and she's trying to get the people, as many as she can, off the boat? I thought that was an interesting decision to to play out the premonition that way because it showed you how this book was going to differ from a lot of the other books in the movies because when it plays out and she saves a couple of the people, she doesn't make it out unscathed. She no. gets really damaged. She wakes up out of a coma a while after this atrocity has happened and she's completely disfigured, disformed. She's never going to model again. And she just goes into this pit of depression. It it almost reminded me of um, that movie Doctor Strange when he gets into the car accident and he's go- they're going through the montage of him getting more yeah. depressed, more depressed, and like drawing more into himself. That's what, pretty much what she did, and I think that's what allowed Death to come for her and entice her to carry out his plan in a way that he can't. Um, so that was just really intriguing. Before we get to that bombshell, though, I do want to talk about what caused the accident. Because ultimately, what caused the accident was shallowness. And uh, a couple guys on a smaller boat seeing all these models, you know, um, up on this boat all hot and everything. These these guys in the little boat not paying attention to things because they're too busy ogling over all these models... uh, so it, their looks were even, the model's looks and shallowness and the shallowness of these guys and everything even drove the disaster to happen. Sure it so wasn't Billy Zane telling them to go faster? Could be. <laughs> but yeah, it, and when she gets as many people off as she can, and of course there's people that don't listen and they die, um, which, you know, when, when the, I don't want to give too much away, I want, I mean, it, we're spoiling it, but I want people to actually... Uh, you know, go back and listen again or whatever, um, or listen to it for the first time if they don't care about spoilers. Um, but a couple of the people that died in the premonition, I thought they would have been the ones that were going to be in the book later, but they didn't get off the boat, you know, when she tried yeah. to get them off. And, uh, yeah, the boat, it, there's an explosion, and, like, ha- half of her face and stuff and, like, arm and stuff uh, gets completely fucked. And, in the, and to the point where... 
some most of the people she saved don't even come to visit her. In fact, I think the only person that visits her is Chardonnay. Caber or uh, Cabernet. Yeah. I know these, these names are just so yeah, vague yeah. and generic. Like I, it's funny because they're they're named under like fancy French wines, but they're generic because they're all thrown together. Oh God, I had to like just in the first two chapters, I had to like recite all these like uh, designers and fancy clothes brands. Like uh, and, and Louis Vuitton. <laughs> I got a lot of them. I got I got a lot of them decent. You know, I said Louis Vuitton. I didn't say Louis. And no, I just said yeah. Did I didn't say Lewis, did I? If I did, I'm sorry. But like somebody wrote, Maybe, he, but, uh, huh? I, I just remember being a kid looking at hors d'oeuvres oh. and being like, hors d'oeuvres. I don't know what's this stuff. I think I, I got a hors d'oeuvres in Georgia. <laughs> but uh, DK, the guy that got me the uh, copy of Death of the Senses and uh, Fr uh, Final Destination 1, 2, and 3 to narrate. Uh, he even commented on one of my first uploads saying he la he got a good laugh every time I messed up a word. There was I got I got more than I expected right, but you know the first two chapters was like people in the modeling world. It was just all about that world the and the fashion, big the cars, the flash, all that. Yeah, you know, and which is an interesting take, especially now that we know that this was supposed to be the plot that Andy McDermott wrote. Uh, you know, from that interview we had with him, and uh, right. but yeah, so she's in the hospital. Only one person visits her, really, and uh, soon after she gets a phone call from Death. And now it's weird because Death actually speaks in this book. He's personified. And the moment they started describing what Death looks like, I'm thinking Tony Todd. They yeah. want Tony Todd to be Death. He's, he's perfect. I can't think of anybody else who could have been better as Death. And I just, I don't think they're ever going to do that in the movies, but, oh, that was so cool. I, I, I figured it was Bloodworth, you know, the way they described yeah. his looks. You know, if it wasn't him, Death just took that appearance, you know. Uh, oh, like, kind of like Meet Joe Black, where the Grim Reaper looks like Brad Pitt, you know. Yeah. Just like pick somebody that just died. So maybe Bloodworth died and he got into his body and uh, was walking around. Or maybe Death has seen this guy, you know, interfering with all these different uh, groups of people going through it. And uh, I've always thought there's two things about Bloodworth. Either he is Death, or he was in a similar thing that happened, like, in his younger days, and he's been beating Death ever since. And right. that's why he can, you know, give out this information. But in this would have been, book... been funny if it was, uh, Death would have been like, Sherry, I need you to kill all these people you saved. Also, drive to Minnesota and kill Bloodworth. Who, who the <laughs> fuck is Bloodworth? You'll, you'll, you'll know. Just go to any morgue, any morgue, and he'll be working there. Um, Do you think this would be a good time to show the first clip of her interacting with the physical incarnation of death? Well, yeah, because at first she thinks she's being, you know, pranked and everything. I think the a pager or something goes off. It even has, like, death on it or whatever. <laughs> and so she runs to the street, and then a payphone starts ringing, you know. And eventually she realizes this is really happening. So she agrees, doesn't really have a choice, and she gets to meet up with death, death incarnate. Right. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's play that first clip of their meeting. What would you like to drink, ma'am? asked the cocktail waitress, who seemed to materialize from thin air the moment Sherry sat down. Vodka martini, gray goose if you have it, Sherry replied, keeping her face pointed down and slightly to one side. Yes, ma'am, the waitress said, jotting it down on her order pad. Ah, gray, my favorite color. Sherry gave a small cry of alarm as she turned to face the voice at her elbow. Sitting beside her was a gentleman who looked to be in his early fifties, dressed in a dapper three-piece charcoal suit. He was thin with a long face, strong nose, and angular cheekbones. His hair was close-cropped and rose into a widow's peak, with snowy temples, and his eyes were a disconcerting shade of pale gray. "'Where did you come from? How did you sit down without me seeing you?' <laughs> the stranger chuckled. It was the same dry, humorless sound she had heard over the phone. I am always with you, my dear, as I am with every living thing. 
I simply do not choose to reveal myself until the time best suits me. I am everywhere and in all things, and have been since the beginning of time. The moment you were born, the seed of your death was planted. But only I know the time, place, and means of your harvest. As we speak, I am taking a fisherman, who has fallen into a storm-swollen sea. I am rocking the cradle of a malnourished infant in the Ukraine. <laughs> I am riding alongside a drunk driver on Highway 78, outside Tupelo, Mississippi. I am doing all these things a thousandfold over. <laughs> Just as the red corpsicles within your body carry oxygen and your lymphocytes generate antibodies to fight infection. Sherry's brow furrowed behind the Venetian mask, unaccustomed to such long-winded talking. So, death is a black guy? The gray man shook his head, clearly amused by her statement. What you see before you bears as much relationship to my true nature as that mask you wear does to your own image. If I showed myself in a truer aspect, your brain would boil in its skull. I could have just as easily manifested myself as a handsome movie actor or a pallid young girl with too much eye makeup. No, child. I chose this form so you would be more receptive to what I have to say. Centuries ago, as mortal things reckon time, something like a god loved a mortal woman. His love for her was so great, he gifted her with second sight. But the woman scorned the god thing, so it turned what had once been a gift into a curse. Her vision was perverted so that she could see the future clearly, but was fated to never be believed by those who sought her counsel. The oracle was doomed to see her brothers slain, her sisters raped, and her city sacked, but was helpless to alter the course of events. She even foresaw her own enslavement and murder, but could do nothing to prevent them. Since that time, her tortured spirit has roamed the earth, seeking a chance to speak its anguish of disaster to those who might heed them. You were one such vessel. But tampering with fate is not without its hazards, as the scars that cover your face and arm are testimony to. You, you, have disrupted the schemata, the master plan by which all things are kept in balance on this plane of existence. Because of your meddling, there are numerous souls living past their predestined harvest. Such dissonance to the master plan threatens to throw all of creation off kilter. So it falls to me to correct the imbalance created by so many lives escaping my clutches. Repercussions could very soon be catastrophic, as these lives exist outside the schemata, interacting with people they were never meant to meet, doing things they were never intended to do, 
so many loose threads creating even more loose threads. Soon they will jam the loom and the very fabric of reality will begin to shear and tear. What does this have to do with me? Sherry asked. What, are you going to kill me? The corners of the gray man's mouth pulled themselves into a rictus grin. Child, I would hardly need to bring you here to do that, no. I asked to meet you to propose business. There is a complicated system of check and balances that control the world invisible to the human eye, as you were responsible for intersecting with the fates of the individual survivors. Your presence is necessary to bring about their harvest. It is imperative that those who escape their deaths be reclaimed by me in the exact order in which they were originally slated to die, and that all six be taken before the birth of the child. Sherry felt something cinch itself tight within her chest. What about the baby? she asked, trying to keep the panic out of her voice. I'm certain even one such as you have heard the analogy concerning a butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazon, and typhoons forming in the Indian Ocean. Once a life never originally meant to exist is brought into this world, the entire schemata must be reworked, and new deadlines assigned to every living thing on the face of the earth. With each reworking of the master plan, the chances of another anomaly such as yours increases exponentially. Are you saying that Cabby's baby being born will cause the end of the world? No, I am saying the child's birth will seriously inconvenience me. The gray man leaned forward, the skull underneath his flesh pressing itself against his coffee-colored skin as if eager to burst forth, while his pale gray eyes dwindled in their sockets. I do not appreciate being inconvenienced. I won't do it. I won't help you kill my friends, Sherry said, shaking her head. What if I sweeten the deal, as you mortals say? Again, the gray man showed his teeth in a death's head grin. The scars you carry on your face and body were never meant to be. They only exist because you acted to save the lives of those you called your friends. What if I told you that with every life you help usher back into the fold, a portion of your former beauty will be restored? I'd say you were lying, Sherry said. A fair enough response. The gray man said with a laugh that creaked like the door of a mausoleum. I grant this small boon to you as a gesture of my good faith. With that, he reached out and gave the back of Sherry's gloved right hand a light tap with one long, thin finger. Sherry gave a startled gasp as a deep chill penetrated her skin all the way to the bone as if she had suddenly plunged her hand into a bucket of ice water. Remove your glove, dear, the gray man said. Go ahead. <laughs> See for yourself. Sherry hesitated, then peeled the black velvet glove. Her breath caught in her throat upon seeing the scarred and twisted claw that had up until a moment ago been her right hand but now replaced by perfectly normal unburned flesh. 
as she stared at her repaired fingers, opening and closing them without pain for the first time in months. Tears began to stream from her eyes, although the mask covering her ruined face remained as impassive as before. Help me with my task, my dear, and reclaim that which was yours. Your beauty, your career, your very life itself, the gray man said, his deep bass voice filling her ears like the pulse of her own heart. Deny me, and you face poverty, degradation, and humiliation. A miserable existence you will be helpless to escape. For I will ensure that no disease, no accident, no weapon shall shorten your suffering. You shall live to be a very old, very wretched creature indeed. But serve me, and you shall reclaim your rightful place as one of the world's greatest models, and you alone of those destined to have died that day will be spurred. As she opened and closed her fist, the icy cold that had permeated her skin and settled in the bones of her right hand traveled up her arm until it found its way to her heart, which it encased in a layer of hard frost. At first she found the sensation disturbing, but after a moment a comfortable numbness set in. The eyes that stared out at the world from behind the mask were colder than a glacier. Who dies first? she asked. Yeah, so I thought, I was, thought it was great seeing death. I mean, after all these movies and all these books, we finally get to see what death thinks, what might, maybe motivates death. I mean, other than us just taking guesses. Yeah. And the bargain is pretty cool, you know. I'll give you back what you lost a little at a time if you give me back what I lost because you prevented me from taking it, you know. Um, so, yeah, she's going to become an agent of death and uh, kind of a shallow reason. Nobody came and visited me in the hospital, you know. Um, I mean, look at the company she keeps. Did she really expect people to send her flowers and stuff? But anyways... That's the bargain, you know. The moment you're... you hear the bargain, you're immediately like, okay, let's see the predictable turn of events. She's probably going to go through with it, realize this is horrible, I shouldn't be doing this, and try to stop. But y you stick with it because it's an interesting uh, concept, and you want to start playing that out. Now, the way some of these deaths play out, I can see how Cherie played a hand in it. But some of them, I don't understand how she could have. They were yeah, so the utter and completely random that if she was part of it at all, I'm impressed. <laughs> Unless, like, maybe, uh, especially, like, the first, it's the first and second one, I think, that take place at the apartment and the music video. <clears throat> Those are the ones that really don't explain what she had to do with it unless there's something going on that we're not being privy to. That she does. Maybe something got cut out of the book in the editing or something. I, I've seen that a couple times where movies just make so much more sense in the script because stuff was cut out for time or for length. But something. That first, that first death, man, that that hot tub thing, that was just brutal. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't. It, it doesn't even start there. You want to break that death down? Go ahead. Uh, I don't know, man. Some of these deaths, I just, I, I really want you as a listener to experience these because they are just they're, they're so intense like we can go through the skeleton of the story but if you want the meat and potatoes you know you gotta dig a little deeper but i will just go and say that some of these were like jigsaw traps and just their their gruesomeness and creativity um she went from shallow model to jigsaw's apprentice and um, the way the way they play out is just like the movies too you know and sometimes even more descriptive the cause and effect of everything this this thing over here falls over, which causes this thing over here to happen. And, uh, you know, the first the first model uh, to die dies in a hot tub in a brutal way. And the second one is, like, on the set of this... Uh, and, oh, video. Sharia just showed up to visit her, you know, and talk to her. And the second one, she goes to the set of this movie, of this music video... Or one of her other model friends that she saved, 
is in a video, and that's the one I don't, I really don't understand how she could have been involved, because she literally only talks to her, and then during the video, um, the girl's hair gets caught, and like it's slowly pulling her hair slowly, and it slowly rips her scalp off before like pretty much just completely decapitating her. Which actually happened in Saw 4, which is funny. <laughs> yeah. Talking about and she saw death when that happened. The woman, the as she's dying, she actually saw, uh, you know, death in the room or whatever, which was kind of a cool little thing. Um, but, you know, after those, that's, that's when things uh, get interesting with the reward that Cherie's getting because each time this happens, a little more and a little more of her scar damage and stuff just disappears completely. Right. Because she has a mask. Like, her friends tried to be nice to her by giving oh, her yeah. a we, mask we of to her touch on face. That Let's go back it, and touch on that party. Go ahead. The party. Yeah, um, her friends... Friends? I gotta yeah. use that with the air quotes. Um, they tried to throw her a party. Happening. What? Before the death started happening, they threw a party. Yeah, where they're trying to make her feel better, and they give her a mask, which is almost a perfect replica of her old face, and it just... It shatters her. She kicks everyone out because it's a representation that her life will never be the same. And they can't understand why she's being so ungrateful and a lot of them leave. And it just, it causes a bigger rift between her and the rest of them that it, I just don't see a way for them to mend friendships after this. I mean, some of them she pretends to just yeah. to get close to them so she could touch them and have them be killed by death. But it's just shallow people dealing with shallow friendships and shallow apologies. And like I said, no amount of depth in their previous life really excuses them from this. I mean, there, there were one or two of them where I, I genuinely felt bad for. They had horrible lives. But at a certain point, when do you when do you stop blaming others for how you are? And when do you start picking yourself up and trying to be a better person? And I think that there just were not many redeeming moments for some of these characters. And we don't get that in a lot of the horror movies and horror novels. There aren't many points where someone looks and says, maybe I should make a change in the way I'm acting or the way I'm thinking to try to be a better person. But by that point, it's too late. You're, you're, you're going to get killed. I mean, that's the point of most of these books. And I'm wondering if there was redemption, would they be spared at all? That's something we don't really get touched on in these Another thing that doesn't really get touched on in this book is the plot of having death being phys a physical being and stuff is so cool and having, but you it, it makes you not even stop and wonder the obvious question: Why does death need help? He's never needed help before. Right. Uh, it, all it is is just a unique way of going at the story. But she does such a good job. You do not you you don't think about that till after you've already enjoyed the book, and then it's a good point. Then, then maybe you're kind of like, wait, death didn't need her, but it doesn't matter because it makes the story more interesting, and that's what it comes down to, the story. Um, so, you know, people, a couple of her friends have died. She's played a hand in it somehow, uh, which she's going to get more involved from here on out on him. Um, but as, as her friends start dying, she feels guilty a little bit, you know, she's, right. she does have second thoughts here and there, but she's getting <clears throat> that beauty back, and, you know, it's it's really just a good versus evil battle going on inside of her, but, uh, you know, her pregnant friend is the only person she really keeps contact with throughout the story, and that's kind of like her her anchor to the good part of her. Um, so, and so go while we're speaking of that, Death also had kind of a, a repercussion if she didn't go through with it. He said, I could make you your old self again if you do these things for me, but if you don't, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to make you live forever ugly. I will make it to where Death myself never touches you. You live till as old as you can possibly be miserable. Which you, I got to say... Whether you want to kill your friends or not, that's a really big motivator to actually yeah. go through with killing these friends. Because, hmm, what are my options? Kill these shallow people I don't like and get my beauty back. Or save five nasty people and be ugly forever. That's yeah. not really a contest, man. I mean, you got to think, what, how much is a human life worth? That, that's really what you got to sit there and think in your mind. 
as far as repercussions of not going through with death design. And like I said, death does try to explain a little bit of why people have these premonitions. He goes into, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, I think I think some Greek gods and goddesses, one of them messed around and got some forbidden knowledge, and it gets passed on. They can't do anything about it. That's the part of the curse. You see yeah. something you can't stop, and it's your unfortunate curse to bear witness, but you really should leave it alone. That's really what it's supposed to be. But the problem is no one ever explains that. Never once did death be like, Yo, you just got a premonition. Don't do anything or else, and I will show you what happens or else if you do something. But but death is happy to do it after the fact. I, yeah, I, I would right. think that going there before would be necessary. And, uh, you know, it's like maybe all the signs they see, why not one that says, keep your mouth shut? You know, <laughs> they'll see little signs everywhere. Keep your mouth shut or else. Or else what? What's going to happen to you if you don't keep your mouth shut? <laughs> Tony Todd's going to show up and make a bargain with you. That's what's going to happen. Um, I, I, yeah. I don't want to go over every single death. Uh, I do want to talk about how she has this boyfriend named Brute. And she's... Is that supposed she, to be a fancy drink? Because it, it, it was B-R-U-T. I'm sure I can look that up. But Gunter, well, he's not a model. Gunter's a photographer. Yeah. Brute was a model. But uh, I think there's like a cologne. He was a sociopath. Yeah, I think there's a cologne or something called Brute. I don't know. But she actually acts surprised whenever he was done with her and one of one of the other ones. Um, so his death, I was kind of rooting for that one when it happened. And he was his a kept monster. You guessing. Huh? He was a monster. Oh, and he, he went out a great way. It's just, you, you thought it was going to happen one way, and then it doesn't, you know? Um, I love that he thinks he's going to die, so he goes to, like, an opium den or something, and, like, Gunther has to get him sobered up, and he's like, stop it! We need to stay in one place! What are you doing, you dummy? Then he just falls in a hole while they're walking. Um, <laughs> falls His right. death was the one though, that I felt was a little over the top. Kind of like the way I, I was thinking about Josh in Halloween, the old Myers place. Go, um, Brute, I feel like, almost died three times before he actually died. So that was it's kind of fun seeing him almost die a couple times. and then Falls in a hole, him. gets washed through the sewer, you know, almost drowns, and eventually just gets hit uh, uh, by something. I love he comes out of the hole and he's like, I lived. I lived. <laughs> um... My favorite death of the book, uh, can't remember the name of the model because they're all blending in my <laughs> they're all blending in my head like a mixed drink. Yeah. Um, one of them goes into Shaking liposuction. Uh, she oh, goes in, that was Rose. Yeah, Rose goes in for liposuction, and what gets her is the doctor, uh, the the nitrous or whatever gets turned on. And yeah. the doctor and the nurse, the, the nurse passes out, the doctor passes out, but the liposuction's already in her, and she's knocked mm -hmm. out, you know, and as she's, like, dying, she's, like, having this wicked dream and stuff, um, but, yeah, she's getting, li like, every ounce of fat is being lipoed out of her body, and uh, that's how she dies. Uh, there's a really cool nightmare in the book I want to talk about without giving away whose dream it is or whose it isn't. Um, it's all the models that have died up to the point in this uh, this part of the story are sitting around a table, and like the scenery's like changing and like melting, and uh, they have these freaky voices and stuff. It was really creepy, uh, really well written. Um, but it kind of reminded me of a scene from the Hannibal TV show, how they're really big into the cinematography and uh, imagery and stuff. I feel like it was a scene from that almost. Yeah, and there's like. Uh, bugs and stuff coming out of them. And it was just really creepy. And uh, pretty much the story, the, 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 the third act of the story is her best friend Cabernet, correct, having the baby. And yes. uh, they're at the hospital. And at this point, she doesn't want Cabernet to go. Um, Gunter, I'm this surprised. Was a great... oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say that was a really great setting for the end of this book, a hospital where it balances with life and death, with the babies being born and people dying. It was just, that was a really interesting choice for the epic showdown, especially with 
her not wanting to kill Cabernet because Cabernet's pregnant, but she also can't get out of the deal because the stakes are too high. So it was really intense seeing all this happen, and Death knows she's thinking about backing out, so he starts coming at her hard. When yeah. she looks in the mirror, her face changes to death, going, Don't you back out on me! That sounds like a good time for a clip right there. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, we'll play the scene of uh, Death letting her know why it's a bad, bad idea to turn good guy all of a sudden. Um, let's roll it. All right. Did you see Gunter on the way in? Yeah, he was smoking outside. Looked like he was having trouble keeping himself together. That sounds like him, she said with a tired grunt. She suddenly grimaced and gripped the bed rails. After a long moment, she dropped back against the bed, panting heavily. She picked up the call button and pressed it with her thumb. Do me a favor, sweetie. Go and get him for me. If he misses me giving birth to this baby, he's going to wish he was dead. Sherry frowned and looked around the room once again. Are you sure you want me to leave? I don't want to leave you alone. I'll be okay. The nurse is on her way. Just just go get him. Hurry! Sherry sighed and stepped out of the room and into the corridor, looking up and down the halls. She saw an RN hurrying in her direction, a concerned look on her face. The nurse's nameplate read L. Fulsey. Excuse me, miss? Nurse Fulsey asked as she uncoiled her stethoscope from around her neck. Were you just in there with Miss Foster? Yes. Does she know? Know what? Sherry asked, trying not to show that she already knew the answer to her question. There was a horrible accident. It happened just a few minutes ago. The father, Mr. Nonhoff? I'm sorry, I'm afraid he's dead. Sherry put her hand over her mouth, trying to hide the fact the information was no surprise to her. Oh my God! Until she's delivered her baby, please don't say anything to her about it. The stress such news would create could be dangerous to both the mother and the baby. Of course, Sherry said, nodding her head. I understand completely. I paged her OB, Dr. Cronenberg. He should be here any minute. He'll want to talk to you before he goes in, I'm sure. With that, Nurse Fulsey opened the door to the delivery suite. From where she was standing, Sherry could see that Cabernet was gripping the bed rails again, grimacing and growling in pain as the child ready to make its entrance. As she turned away from the scene within the hospital room, she caught a glimpse of her own reflection in the glass-fronted fire alarm case on the other side of the hall. Only it couldn't have been her reflection, because it had gray eyes. What, what the, the hell, hell are, are you doing, doing out, out in the hall? hall? Snarled the apparition. You, you were told to stay, stay in the room with, with her. her. I know. It's just that she asked me to go find Gunter, and now I have to wait on the doctor before I can go back in, Sherry replied, trying her best to keep her voice low so she would not be overheard. I'm not, I'm not interested in excuses. In excuses. I'm, I'm only interested in results. The apparition shouted back. So, so that, that you will understand. I will illustrate my displeasure in terms you can readily comprehend. For every excuse you give me, I will undo a portion of my handiwork. Starting now! Sherry grimaced as a jolt of pain, as sharp as a searing needle shot across her forehead. When she opened her eyes, she could see that the reflection in the glass in front of her was once more her own. The solitary scar that bisected her brow had gone from white to bright red. Upon seeing the change, her lips drew themselves into a thin line, and her eyes seemed to frost over like window panes on a winter evening. Yeah, just really Wait. intense. You like what I did there with the uh, with the echo type effect? Uh, you, creep me, you creep me out. <laughs> Gunter, you know, he had a pretty he had a pretty cool death uh, towards the end of the book at the hospital. Um, but I actually if, wanted him to survive, but yeah, I mean, no, I kinda his wanted, final destination. It would have been cool to see him and Cabernet get to get to live and raise the baby, but 
Yeah. I mean, look at the way Death of the Senses ended. Um, the only guy that made it out of that one was the asshole cop that I hated the whole book. Um, uh, write me a write me an epilogue to that about how after Jack and her die, he can't handle it anymore, so he like shoots himself in the doorway. Um, yeah. Some closure. You know what? We'll just say that's what he did. Um, because he saw his partner die in front of him after all the warnings, and he didn't have and he didn't have anybody else left to berate for the rest. Of I get his name now. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's so good at berating people. Berate or whatever, berate. Uh, anyways, back to this book. Fucking um, <laughs> I, d- I, don't, I don't want to uh, give away too much. I mean, yeah, most of you have read the book or listened to it. Um, yeah. So you know what the conclusion is like. But if there is people that haven't, I really want them to hear it. Uh, we'll spoil some stuff. But the, uh, the ending's pretty cool. Uh, before we get our flash forward, you know, a little t- a little time past all this, uh, she makes the right decision, the you know, in the end, and uh, we get a little flash forward where she thinks everything's fine and dandy, and uh, in Final Destination style, I will give away the ending, and I have no problem with that. Uh, Sean? Extra spoiler! Extra spoiler! No one can't say anything. Oh no! You you get you get to finish this off here because uh, I love this ending, um, the way it plays out, and who's behind the wheel when it plays out. So, can you walk us through the ending of the book here, and how what happens when she thinks it's all good and she cheated death, still saved her friend? Actually, I want to hear you say it. You're all you're all into it. You already set it up, man. So she thinks everything's good and. She's cheated death, and her and Cabernet and the baby's going to live happily ever after. And uh, they're heading out, and she gets another message or whatever, death, you know. And by the time she realizes what's going on and looking up, there's a bus just hurtling straight for her. And in the driver's seat is death, uh, who we think is Tony Todd. And it just it, the way it plays out is just so fun. Um, I think I'm going to include that. I think that's going to be the closure, the closer of this uh, podcast. Yeah. So stick around after we say our goodbyes and our ratings. We're going to end it with the uh, conclusion because I really enjoyed. I think out of all the Final Destination books, that's my favorite ending. Um, it should have been the bus driver from the first one going, "Not again!" Not again! Shit! Wait, <laughs> bus driver from the first one was Jack from Death of the Senses. It doesn't make sense. I said it would just be funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe like if, survive, like if he survived, survived the last book, that was Jack, right? That was like the big revelation, and that's what tied it to the. Yeah, it was Jack. I remember. Um, if I'm yeah. wrong, but I, I remember that that being like his. That's why he moved to New York and was all depressed and shit because he had hit somebody on a bus. Um, right. Anyways, so yeah, that's uh, looks could kill, and if I was gonna rate it. I would give it at least, uh, well, with Dead Man's Hand, de- I'd put it between Dead Man's Hand and Death of the Senses, I'd give it like a 3.5, 3, 4, I'll get, this is hard for me on this one. Uh, I'm, I'm giving gonna, it a 4, man. I got I'm gonna, a 4. I'm going to give it a 3.5. I can't give it a 4, because it's not my favorite, but, uh, it's really good. 3.5, uh, just because I don't get the whole modeling world thing, and that was a little irritating sometimes. Uh, maybe I'm a little jaded because I had to narrate all that garbage. <laughs> you know, no, I'm not saying the book's garbage. Author, you did an amazing job on this book. It was a lot of fun. I'm talking about all the model jargon and having to say it. Maybe I'm a little jaded from having to say all that constantly, but uh, I really enjoyed the book. Had a lot of fun with it. You know, I'll give it a 3.8. Uh, you know, a little bit closer to four, but I, I just can't give it a four uh, because there was a lot of shallow characters, not a lot of redeeming qualities in the characters, and I didn't really feel much for when a lot of them died. And I like a book that makes me feel for the characters. Um, but I love the ending, and I love death being included, and uh, the dream sequence and all that, the liposuction kill. So yeah, solid 3.8, just because I don't want to give it a four, but I don't want to give it too low of a score. Sean? I give it a solid four out of five. The characters, I mean, they were shallow, but we got a lot of backstory on them that, that really colored them in to give me more 
of an idea of what's going on in their head, what led them to these decisions. And every time I thought I knew what was going to happen, it twisted me and did something different. It was it was unlike any Final Destination book, movie I've seen. It kept me on the edge of my seat. I liked the new things they did with it, the personification of death, um, the fact that she had to be death's lackey, but it wasn't like she was going to die if she said no. It was just really bad consequences if yeah. she didn't. Uh, I really like this book. I'd give it a four out of five, and the only reason I give it a four and not a five is because Final Destination's not one of my biggest franchises. Um, getting into it, I just I can't buy that death is the killer. And yeah. I know, I know it's that fun. It's just I just can't get behind that. Um, I will say she tried to make me care for the character. Um, the the author tried to make me care for the characters. Um. But by then it's too late. You know they've already showed the, they've already shown the person they become. So at that point it doesn't matter who they were, uh, and may even if because some of the backstories are sad as hell. Like they re, the author really tries to make you feel for these characters with their backstories. Man, for the most Chardonnay, part. oh my god! Oh yeah, Chardonnay. I, so bad for her. Her mom is just a raving lunatic. Um, but if, but it's like yeah. There's a lot of people that have shitty upbringings that don't become shallow assholes, you know, uh, sociopaths and all. So I just, I don't want to give it a 4, but I don't want to give it a 3.5. So that's why I went with 3.8. Because um, it was it was a lot of fun. And uh, Dead Reckoning is behind it for me. But only, be, and we'll talk about that when we get there. My biggest problem with Dead Reckoning, another Final Destination book, was the inconsistency in the characters. Uh, that's going to be a big topic of discussion when we talk about that book. Um, but yeah, you know, Final Destination looks could kill. Great book. Fun read. Fun listen. Be sure to check it out. There'll be a link at the end after the uh, closing clip. Uh, thumbnail there. Check out the Unabridged audiobook. Uh, anything else, Sean? No, I think that just about wraps it up. And um should have some fun conversations in After the Slash. Yeah. And until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, pleasant dreams, be excellent to each other, and we'll see you next time. This is Sean Campbell saying, if this one doesn't scare you, you're already dead. Roll that ending of the book clip now. Cabernet sat in the back of her chauffeured limo and smiled down at her son, who was strapped into his infant car seat alongside her. Skye gave his mother a toothless grin and kicked his feet and waved his hands in unison. When he smiled, he was very much his father's child. Cabby gave a little smile that was both loving and sad as she caressed her son's chubby little cheek. There was not a day that went by that she did not turn and expect to see him standing in the kitchen doorway, quietly watching her cook, as he so often had. When she woke up in the middle of the night, she often thought she heard him snoring next to her in the bed. Sometimes, when she was downstairs nursing Skye while watching TV, she could swear she could hear the stairs in the townhouse squeak and groan, as if he was walking down to join her from his office. When they finally told her what had happened to Gunter, the word struck her like a blow from a sword, cleaving her heart in twain. Part of her had died, while yet another part had been born on that the greatest and worst day of her life. For one horrible moment, she had felt herself come apart, as if all it would take to send her spiraling into the abyss would be a single breath. But then she had heard her baby cry, and she knew then that she had everything to live for cradled there in her arms. Still, if it hadn't been for Skye and, to a lesser extent, Sherry, she did not know what would have become of her. Both of them needed her in totally different ways for completely different reasons, and helping to take care of them, she was able to deal with the aching emptiness left by Gunter's cruel and sudden death. She was determined to make a good thing come from the horrible tragedy that had robbed her of the love of her life and her baby's father. Upon going through his personal papers following his death, Cabernet had discovered that Gunter had recently purchased several high-dollar life insurance policies for himself, all of which paid double indemnity in case of accidental death. Apparently, he had been concerned about providing for his new family in case of the unthinkable. After all, he did travel extensively in his line of business and had been increasingly concerned about the possibility of the commercial air carriers he flew on crashing after takeoff 
or being piloted into tall buildings. By the time the insurance companies had all settled up, the total amount was just under $2 million, and that did not even take into consideration the out-of-court settlements her civil attorney had got from the linen service in the hospital. Still, she would gladly give up every cent of the insurance money if she could have Gunter back, but that was impossible. There was no reclaiming the life she once had, just as there was no way Sherry could ever go back to being a model. However, that did not have to mean there was no future for them. Gunter would not have wanted her to simply give up and quit. So she decided to put her new fortune and her business degree to work and create something new, not just for herself and Skye, but for Sherry as well. She glanced down at the attaché case at her feet. Inside it were the business plans for her very own modeling agency. She was going to propose over dinner that Sherry come in with her as her partner and together they could continue Merlot's legacy and participate in the industry they knew so well, only this time from behind the camera. She had often talked about doing something similar with Gunter late at night, as they lay in bed tangled in each other's limbs, and she knew deep down in her heart that it was what he would have wanted for her to do. Although, in all fairness, he probably would not have approved of her choice in business partners. Meanwhile, Sherry hurried down the hallway to the elevator, her Louis Vuitton suitcase in one hand, her Gucci purse slung over her other shoulder, and her cell phone tucked into the front breast pocket of her Prada jacket. She was excited to finally be free to walk the streets of New York once again, now that her face had been restored and her immune system had bounced back from the anti-rejection drugs. She felt stronger and more positive than she had since the initial accident that destroyed her career. At least this time she knew she had a home waiting for her, one she did not have to worry about being taken away from her, since Cabby had paid off the mortgage on the loft for her. With Gunter no longer in the way, she and Cabernet were free to resume the tight friendship they had once had. Sherry was determined to make sure her friend never had cause to regret helping her out, and she was eager to start being a godmother to little Skye and provide him with the love, support, and guidance she had never got from her own blood relations. Things would not be easy for her, but at least her future was considerably brighter than it had been months before. She would have to struggle and face hardships, but at least she was no longer haunted by mad dreams of being stalked by death personified as an elderly black man dressed in a gray suit. Thinking back, she could not help but chuckle at how ridiculous it was. As she exited onto the street, she scanned the portion of the sidewalk directly in front of the hospital designated for loading and unloading of patients, but did not spot Cabby's limousine. Sherry, over here! The former model looked in the direction of the shout and saw her friend standing on the curb across the street from the hospital entrance, waving with her left hand from behind a brand new Mercedes sedan, while holding her infant son balanced on her hip with her right arm. Sherry grinned and returned her friend's wave. Look, Sky, Cabby said to her son, pointing across the four lanes of traffic. There's Auntie Sherry. Wave hello. Sky gurgled and flapped his arms, bouncing merrily up and down on his mother's hip. Cabernet smiled and lowered her arm, her left hand automatically going into the pocket of her jacket. As she did so, her fingers brushed against the photograph she always carried with her. Without really thinking, she removed the picture and glanced down at it. When the police had finally released Gunter's personal effects, following the investigation into the accident, she had been surprised to discover that the snapshot had been amongst them. She recalled vaguely receiving the photograph in the mail. Justinian, one of Merlot's favorite stylists, had tucked it inside a sympathy card. She had stuck the picture on the fridge as a reminder of happier times then pretty much forgotten about it. She was baffled that Gunter, of all people, would have cared enough to remove it and carry it about on his person. But then, perhaps, it wasn't that surprising come to think of it. After all, despite his cynical nature and acerbic wit, he had been, at his very heart, a dyed-in-the-wool romantic, and although she had never really noticed it before, she had to admit that the light that seemed to shine down on her face and hers alone made her look like a Renaissance Madonna. Sherry looked up and down the street, judging the speed and flow of the traffic. There was a marked crosswalk just up the block, but she was in too big a hurry to wait any longer to start her brand new life. 
Gathering up her belongings, she sprinted quickly across the four lanes towards the waiting limo. Her cell phone began to ring. Without breaking her stride, she plucked the cell phone from her breast pocket and frowned down at the caller ID, puzzled at who could possibly be calling her at that exact moment. In blinking block letters against the pale green background was the name Death. There was the sound of screaming brakes, and Sherry looked up from her cell phone to find herself staring at a city bus barreling down on her. The driver was an old African-American man with a long face and receding gray hair, dressed in the gray uniform of a mass transit employee. As he slammed on the brakes, he gritted his teeth, revealing a set of dentures that made it look like he had a mouthful of tombstones. The last thing she saw was the final destination sign on the bus located just above the windshield. It read, Terminal.